Hi, everyone. I'm Claudia Villanuza. My guest today is Marino Fedanaigam, the VP of Risk and Assurance at ANZ Bank in the US. Marino has nine plus years of tech risk and compliance experience. He has a focus on combining those three things to implement and improve the strategy of an organization. Marino has experience with USA, New Zealand, and Australian regulatory and risk environments in banking. And he currently has multiple roles running the first uh, line risk team, business continuity team, as well as co-founding and running the innovation team at ANZ New York with a focus on improving processes, working with new technology and helping staff learn new skills. Marino holds a Bachelor of Law and a Bachelor of Health Science from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And he's currently enrolled in a master's program at NYU Stern uh, School of Business focusing on end and risk. Did I get that right? Risk management, yeah. Risk management, okay. Yeah. Well, Marino, welcome to Future of Work. Hello, thanks for having me, Claudia. Thanks for joining us. So you're you're on you're you're on a bit of a leave right now having a bit of fun so that's good yeah no i'm in san francisco so it's it's good just to get away doing some stuff for the board i'm part of but this is nice to get away from new york after what 15 months of not much travel and pandemic and staying in an apartment so i think life is coming back in the usa which is very very nice yeah, definitely. And thanks, thanks again for for joining us uh, and and taking time out of you know being in San Francisco. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you. So, just to get things started, since this is a podcast uh, slash show about learning, what is the last thing that you learned that got you really, really excited, and why? And this doesn't have to do with anything in particular; just something that you learned and that got you excited. Yeah, pro probably two things. And I think I talked to, uh, to you about it maybe last year. So I think during the pandemic, like most people, when we're all stuck in our houses, or in my case, an apartment, a small apartment in New York City, was going a bit uh, stagnant and, and slightly bored seeing the same walls all the time, not physically seeing people. And I think for me, I, I learn a lot being in the office and learning from very experienced bankers and colleagues and people we interact with. And that kind of stopped a bit because of the pandemic. So two things I've started or got me really excited really was near the middle of the pandemic, I enrolled into a cybersecurity program. And I, I work in cybersecurity in terms of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis from a governance and policy perspective, but I'm not a coder. I didn't study information systems or computer science. So it was more a boot camp to learn about the infrastructure, hardware and hacking and the real skills people need, I guess, from the engineering side of things. So it was quite scary. It was quite intense. I was challenged quite a bit which is good because I wanted to be. But yeah, it was, it was something that I wanted to learn, not to become an expert, but just to understand how it worked so I can do my job a lot better. So that was pretty cool. And the second thing is something I'm working on is I want to start writing blogs and opinions, given I've been in the industry for a while in risk management. And I've started doing a lot of work on writing better effective writing i think my writing is pretty crap at the moment so i need to get but it's something that i'm just working on and and learning because i think that's something i'm passionate about and hopefully start publishing things in the next next wee while you don't need to make that face by the way <laughs> what face <laughs> When I said my wife's <laughs> writing's crap. <laughs> well, so I can say as someone who has uh, read your writing in a couple of contexts before, I can tell you that it's not <laughs> crap. So <laughs> no, that's, thank you. That, that's good. Uh, but we can always be better, right? So I mean, we can all be better. You know, I mean, I, I bet that you know anybody who who writes, I bet that you know what's his name, the Haruki Murakami is an author that I really like. I bet when he writes his first draft, it's probably not that good. So yeah, <laughs> don't be well, so hard on yourself. <laughs> uh, thank you, Claudia. I'm really excited about that that blog that you're starting though. 
seriously just yeah so what my focus is on and i think this is an area where i'm probably going to start focusing on in the future and it's why i'm doing my masters as well is to focus more on the risk management side of artificial intelligence ethics bias especially in the financial services industry as you know we're talking about ai a lot later um in this podcast but as we start focusing on AI and automated decision making, et cetera, whether it's financial service, et cetera, there's a lot of bias. There's a lot of ethics that comes into this, how it's programmed, how it's reviewed. And my worry is for the future that it's going to cause more inequality than um, we imagine in terms of how the decisions get made in an automated way. And I know that whole point of technology should be to improve society and there is a huge I think gap people are forgetting that it could probably possibly go the other way if we don't address that and have ethical guidelines principles and uh, all that built into these decision making tools so we don't increase the inequality that already exists and I think we saw inequality get increased quite a bit during the pandemic and that shows how much it does exist so yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this is, it's a great uh, seg into, into the, really the, the next question that I had for you here, because in terms of AI and data technologies in, in banking, there's, I think that this is really like a, a really, a very hot topic of, of discussion, because this, this thing is happening, it's coming right now, it's not a matter of if, <laughs> it's happening right now. So, and banking, you know, is, and finance in general has always been kind of a a place where inequality is just very obvious. So first let's talk about the, the AI and AI skills and data utilization in banking, and then we'll discuss the ethical implications. So I was wondering, what do you think is missing in the banking industry right now in order for, for, for the industry and banks in general to use data effectively because right now we're seeing you know we're definitely seeing a lot of ai tools being rolled out and we're seeing a lot of initiatives across the industry um but everybody that i i personally speak with and interact with and the the feeling that i get is that it's we're not quite there yet so what what do you think are the things that are missing for us to be there yeah so it's, it's a good question. And I think in my mind, there's three things that's missing in the banking industry. So if you look at banking as a whole, and you've experienced working with different banks as well, is that there are large old legacy systems and they've got uh, legacy infrastructure and effectively, over, you know, banking's, banking's quite a, a an industry that's lasted quite a long time. But what hasn't changed is the legacy systems and the technology and the infrastructure that has been being used for the last 50 years. We're still using, especially in the USA, we're still using systems infrastructure that we've been using 40 years ago that hasn't really changed. So in my mind, there's three things I think needs to happen before AI can even be embedded and used as a force in the banking industry. And that's the senior management of every bank needs to actually invest in improving that technology and systems to a state, not that it would be very valued right now, but also future proof it for the next 10 to 20 years. So you can consistently and continuously keep adding to it. And I think that is an expensive, long, large journey. And I think that needs to speed up a lot faster than it is going right now, because what I think is happening is that people are realizing that the legacy systems are very hard to improve. And if you can't improve it, it's a matter of replacing, which is an even bigger project. The second is I don't think banks have the right skill set at the moment. Currently, if you look at bankers, you know, they're bankers, a few engineers and information systems people and data analysts around If banks really want to embed AI, they need their own digital, I guess, warriors and artificial intelligence experts and data analysts and engineers. And it kind of has to become the place where people want to work in. So if you look at banks, they're currently competing with Amazon, Apple, the technology firms, 
and I think right now they're not in a position to have the right skill sets in senior management and um, the right teams and they need to keep building this out right and collaboration um, collaboration in the sense of not collaborating with tech firms but more banks need to collaborate with each other because they possess a whole lot of data they've got an incredible amount of data if they don't start collaborating with each other on certain aspects, then the customer, which the bank effectively exists for, is the customer, isn't really going to benefit. And I think that needs to be seen on a more um, accessible basis as well. So I think if, if they can get those three things right, and some banks are doing that, some banks are slow, some banks are beginning, I don't think AI is really going to come into force just yet. I think it'll still be another decade Wow, a decade. I think so. To get to get to where I think you and I probably want AI to be a big focus on banks, right? I look at banks right now without naming any banks. People are still using spreadsheets. People are still using manual inputs, data entry. So I think, to, you know, you need to move all the existing broken processes before you can actually implement automated processes and then start using artificial intelligence as an engine to make decisions and you know far make things a lot faster so i think it's still 10 years away to where we want to get to interesting unless something i guess fundamental happens yeah and i think that fundamental thing that's happened is the pandemic i think i don't know if you've seen that meme that you know what what pivoted or accelerated our digital journey? Was it your CEO, your chief digital officer, or was it COVID-19? And it was COVID-19 because everyone would work from home. People realized you had to become more accessible to customers. Your digital, your digital platforms needed to improve. And, you know, a lot of banks have started putting a lot more money in since the pandemic because they've realized, you know, this has changed how we work and how we work with our customers for the future. Yeah, definitely. No, I think I think that, you know, and we'll discuss this, you know, a bit further because I really want to I want to dig into how the pandemic has changed things. But I think that's really what happened, I think, across industries. And it was probably more dramatic in banking because in in banking, work from home was kind of a definitely not a very accepted type of endeavor. I got the feeling. Yeah, and I just just to round out that question, if if the banks don't move faster in the next 10 years they they will have to face up to all the new fintechs that are coming up right because that's why the fintech industry really exists because of all these gaps in the banking industry um, and how slow the banks move because of their legacy systems technology and the startups fintechs etc or even ragtags find all these gaps because it's just not moving fast enough the customers are being left behind and they're plugging into where they are. And if banks don't continue to fast pace themselves, the fintechs will get to a stage where they're direct competitors really with banks, which was, I think we are starting to see already with payments and and some, some elements of fintechs really starting to grow out. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think fintech is a force to be reckoned with for sure. And I think it's, I I think it's definitely here to stay. It's not going to go away. But that said, I do think that banks tend to have, and correct me if I'm wrong, they they tend to have a bit of a, how should we put this, moat around many services that they offer simply due to regulation. And you know a lot about regulation, so I wanted to hear uh, your take on what do you think is the future of work in banking? How do you think regulation is going to, to change or perhaps be changed? And how do you think we're going to, to get there from where we are now? Yeah, so it's a good question. So I think for banking, the future of works, especially since the pandemic, is from a physical sense, most banks, and I think most banks are already starting to do this, is going to move into a more hybrid work environment. So, for example, pre-pandemic, I was in the office five days a week. Most of my colleagues and other banks were in the office five days a week and not many people were working from home. Maybe you know, once in a while we'd be working from home. Post-pandemic, I think 
a lot of banks will be moving to that hybrid model where you work mm. two to three days a week um, in the office and two days out of the office at your home or wherever you are. The thing I don't think will change for banking is I don't think banks will ever be remote. And the reason I say this is because fundamentally a bank survives because of its customers or clients, whether it be retail, commercial, institutional. And when you're in the office and and you're with your colleagues, there is a big element of collaboration, problem solving, just getting into a room and figuring out how to how to you know ensure these the deals people are working on is going to benefit the customer how um, you're going to solve issues or problems from a process or a regulatory or a policy issue and that I think is is incredibly valuable so I've been working from home for about 14 15 months and now I am in the office one to two days a week on a voluntary basis. And basically those one to two days a week, I find that there's so many colleagues that, that do come in that we just get into a room and solve problems a lot quicker. And it's, it's just a lot easier. And I think it applies to all industries, but banking is a very customer client focused industry, right? The, a fundamental point of a bank is relationships and, and maintaining those relationships. So I think that we won't ever be remote. However, I think in the future of how regulation will change is a couple of things. I think technology and, you know, if we take things, something as crypto, like cryptocurrency and the crypto world, right? This is, that's just heading off and it's going into all sorts of different avenues and, and spaces and regulation hasn't really caught up because regulation usually takes a while to catch up with a technology and 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 where new markets start going so i think in the future regulation will start looking at the new infrastructure and technology not just banks but effectively what technology is going to be inputted so if we look at crypto it's probably most likely going to be regulated in the future if it's regulated, banks might start playing in that field. Banks aren't really playing in that field because it's unregulated and it's just too risky and volatile. Same as AI and other elements, I think it's going to start being regulated in terms of what we can do in terms of artificial intelligence, how we can implement it. And this is probably the benefit where banks have over fintechs to an extent is that banks have always been regulated. We're regulated to the nth degree, right? We have so many different regulators based on what products and services we offer. So the minute new regulations come and we start looking into new technology, we are already in a space where we can pivot very quickly because we know how to handle regulations. We've got very good relationships with regulators and we've got, you know, people with skills within our industry that can help us they're faster which is probably a benefit we have but i think regulation as well is moving very slow both in the tech fintech and crypto world and i think it'll be another 10 years until they really start catching up on as well so i think the hybrid work system is going to be there to stay i don't think banking will ever be fully remote and i think regulation will start catching up on the new technologies in the next 10 years but i think the banks will be in a good place to meet them as well yeah definitely and also on that note i think fintech is kind of has that that advantage over banks the fact that you know they can just go ahead and try something and do it and you know exactly. ask, ask yeah. for forgiveness instead of asking for permission <laughs> right yeah and and we're limited because a we have a lot of reputational issues to consider you know we already we've got history with clients and regulators and we do have a role to play in terms of being corporate responsibility right so we can't just pick something up and just try it and ask for forgiveness later that will impact us and our shareholders etc so we do have a big focus on corporate responsibility any bank really does and i think that's why we don't just jump into new spaces right away but we do do a lot of research development in a safe space and get permissions from regulators to try things but obviously not pivot like the fintechs and you know every at the end of the day when something can becomes big enough it usually is regulated 
Yeah, definitely. And also, I feel like when it comes to fintech and banking, it's kind of like uh, fintech is a bit like the the ideal sandbox environment, if you will, right? Like mm. it's one of those things where they can try something. If it works out great, they can, you know, a bank will typically, you know, buy them or otherwise integrate their technology, which is a mm. win-win for everybody, right? And if it doesn't, then they crash and burn, then that's the fintech and it's not the bank and, you know, we've tried yeah. something it didn't work for whatever reason and we can move on correct um, and and i don't think it's not really a bad thing end of the day regulation is really there to protect your customer right right and clients so if if regulation is there that's really usually to benefit and protect customer society ensure that you know we are playing within guardrails and not going off in end of the day affecting someone or client or a customer negatively. So I think regulation is a good thing. It's just ensuring that everyone is aware of it and applying the same rules, I guess. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. So going back to to AI and the the rollout of of both artificial intelligence as well as, well as just new technologies in general, you touched on the fact that it tends to be very a, a typically a slow process in, in a bank for obvious reasons, regulations being one of them. But it gets to the point, I believe, in some cases where it's really, it, it, the, the barrier to, to, to trying out new things is such that, you know, you'll have really banks working with technologies, for example, that are that are decades old, right, which is, not only not ideal in terms of a, an efficiency and productivity standpoint, but it's actually at, give it enough time that it would end up being a, a liability in terms of security, in terms of, you know, in terms of the very things that the regulations are trying to, to safeguard, right? So AI skills and, you know, moving on to new technologies and learning, fun, you know, fundamental skills and updating work practices is something that, you know, I believe we all agree and ask anybody in, in banking, we all agree that it's a good thing and we should do, but we still see this situation where, you know, people are like, yeah, great. We want to do this. We want to, we want to bring, you know, new technologies on board. We want to bring new tools but regulation prevents what we can do with our data or regulation prevents, you know, the types of things that, you know, how we can store our data, for example, and, you know, overhauling that is just a very risky process and it's a very kind of time and, and resource intensive process. So both in terms of adoption and in terms of gaining the skills to, to utilize these new, these new tools and new technologies, what do you think is the best way for for banking as an industry given its constraints to get there yeah so i think there's two options right and my, my bank does this to an extent and i think most banks do the big banks anyway than i know of both in usa asia and australia and that is i think the first task is the banking workforce is large right every right. You know, if you look at my my bank, ANZ, we've got, you know, 50 to 60,000 employees globally. I think JP Morgan's got a ton, Goldman, etc. So the current workforce is large and the workforce is a lot older, right? And the digital landscapes really come in the last five to 10 years to an extent. So the first element is actually upskilling your current staff to understand and work on you know what whatever area they're in whether it's with customers or risk or finance on what skills they need to upskill to make them more digitally capable of improving their own processes but also working with systems and not being too scared of changing the way they work because i think usually the barrier is that often people are comfortable in either their roles or something they've been doing for years that they need to change their approach and that scares and scares a lot of people. There's a bit of fear of change, right? And not everyone likes change too much. So I think it's about upskilling 
the current bankers and bank staff to a more digitally capable workforce. So I'm not saying learn everyone learn coding, but everyone should learn how to work and navigate digital the digital ecosystem, whatever it is, and start understanding more of you know what it is they need in their area to upskill as well. So I think that's one big element. And without people upskilling and becoming more digitally native, you can't really just plug in the new shiny AI toy and expect everyone to to just start using it, right? So right, I think yeah. that's one element. And I think a lot of people are starting to become more interested. It's just motivating them to get there. And the second element is, or second option really, is that I did mention that banks have legacy systems, infrastructure, and it's like having an old train. Do you want to rebuild the old train with new systems or do you just want to build a brand new train? And sometimes it's just way easier to build a brand new train because it's more expensive to build the old one, right? Rebuild it. So what some banks are doing, our bank does this to an extent, a lot of other banks are starting to build their own digital digital bank, which is kind of a side project. And they're starting everything from scratch, including systems. You know, some banks are starting right in the cloud. Some banks are just starting their own program of work right on the side, calling it a slightly different um, name. And they are starting to plug the old infrastructure into the new infrastructure and over time the side project becomes the new infrastructure and system that people will start using over the next 10 to 20 years so that seems to be possibly a faster more effective way and that way you're building a brand new with engineers and data scientists and really getting the future set up and that is an option so I guess for both you still need to upskill your staff and employees but I think that's probably the best way of pivoting and getting to where you need to use AI faster than trying to rebuild something that already exists which is quite quite hard and long. And I think that's why uh, AI is taking a while to come into banking, right? Build something new like the fintechs. They just start like that, something new, new platform, just start plugging things in as they go. And it's easier because they're developing, thinking about the future, whereas the banks have pipes so intertwingled everywhere with their legacy systems that it's so much harder to unwind it and uh, and then put in new plugins, et cetera. So... I guess that's probably the best option to get where you need to get for AI to be used. And then people will start using those new systems and hopefully be digitally set up to be successful in it. Yeah, definitely. It's It comes back to the, to the discussion that we had earlier about fintechs being kind of like a sandbox for the banking industry. Mm. You know, you either wait for somebody else to develop it or, you know, entrepreneurial and innovative banks you know like like anz you know go ahead and and build their own and and you know build a new train like you put it yeah yeah that's a it's a really really neat way to approach it yeah so what do you how how do you spend your days these days at work how has your work changed in the past year just to, to change tack a bit because you know we discuss these these abstract things and and you know, we're, we're all kind of focused on on what we do on, on the day to day. And we oftentimes don't look back, you know, to see how, how things have changed. So how has it changed for you? Yeah. So for me personally um, and professionally, probably more professionally, to be honest, the work's just changed dramatically. So I had the privilege of running our business disruption for our, our bank for USA and looking after it. So what that means really is when you know, there's things like technology failure or um, what's really happened in the last 15 months of pandemic. How do you ensure that you can continue effectively and effectively running your firm from another site and the other site being working from home? So the last 15 months has been really, really full on. It's probably been it has actually been the most busiest time in my entire career, but then the most uh, incredible learning time as well because our bank and most banks have not been um, set up really to have their workforce 
be present working from home 100% for a 15 months running straight, right? You know, the tech firms, yes, but banks, not really. And getting that set up and running. So what, what we did in the last 15 months is we went really from everyone being in the office for 100% of the time. And we have a lot of regulations that require us to be in the office, like our markets, our traders, et cetera. Right, right. We had to move from that to, you know, health and safety is so important and ensuring that everyone can be safe at home and continue working and still us run our bank effectively and efficiently was was a big thing. So we worked with our technology teams to bring everyone to remote working, which was a huge change, which included getting everyone set up at home, getting monitors set up, getting the infra, you know, our VPN, our internet, it's all that set up, testing it, you know, within the space of two weeks, getting all the right approvals for um, all the regulatory needs that we needed to do to ensure we can continue doing what we're doing from home and, you know, things like monitoring systems and all, all, all that that was in the office, getting it set up at home was a big task that, you know, if we, wanted to do that without a pandemic would have probably taken months and months maybe a year but we managed to do it in two weeks because we had to (laughs) and I think that was a huge change for us because we're especially our firm here in USA where we're only 120 odd staff so that was you know everyone's on the same floor everyone's always talking to each other so that's a big change and we set ourselves up that way as did all other banks so that was a huge piece of work and that really took a lot out of me personally six months of getting that ready and then continuing to monitoring that given you know it was pretty scary at one point where New York was the epicenter and the news and looking outside especially my apartment I saw I heard and saw ambulances every 10 minutes so you know, ensuring health and safety was paramount was important as well and still functioning and I guess the adrenaline runs for about six months, then you get a bit tired. And I found that working hours, like everyone else in all industries working from home, was starting to burn out. You are working longer hours because, A, you're stuck at home. <laughs> There's nothing much else to right. do. You're you know, constantly on your phone and your laptop and logging in and doing, doing work. And I think that's what I probably uh, appreciated when I went to work from home is that there is that balance of sometimes when you leave the office, often, you know, not all the time, but often you don't need to log back in and, and continue working. Whereas when you're at home, that just merges and you don't know where it is, right? It's at 7 p.m. already and you and because you're home, you don't tend to learn to switch off. So right. that, that has definitely changed. I've had to learn to rebalance myself, which I've probably done better in the last four or five months in the first 12 and I think that's changed a lot in the sense of just just pulling myself back and starting to do things to balance like you know going outside gymming actually taking holidays etc now that we can and seeing people a lot more so I think that's changed I think I'm glad I can go back to the office on a voluntary basis which is nice because it's a good set of scenery you get a bit bored of seeing your room the entire time and I think going forward, it's it's definitely changed the way I work and think, and I think that will kind of kind of continue on for the next twelve months as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely hear you about the whole getting bored of seeing your room and, and needing to to go and, and and see someplace else. By the way, I don't know if you've been hearing. I, I have a couple of cats that are meowing very insistently outside my door. You're not hearing that, right? No, I'm not. Okay, not good. all. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe you are because you're so close to them. <laughs> just checking, just checking, but it's good. I'm happy you're not hearing, not hearing them. So we're almost out of time here. I wanna, I wanna make sure that we we wrap up our conversation. But I wanted to ask you one last thing. What's a really cool project or initiative that you really, you know, you've been working on lately, and you're really excited, and you want to share with the world? And you know, if 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 there's anything that you would like our audience to check out or do. Yeah, so I think it's probably what I mentioned right at the start. So started doing a lot of writing and blogging around ethics, AI, mm-hmm. bias, that element, and and building my own website called Futuristic Risk, which is going to talk about 
how to effectively manage risk in this new environment, all my opinions, etc. Nothing from my firm. So I should right. probably mention that. So I'm hoping to publish that in the next couple of months. And it's a matter of when, not if, I guess. And I'm excited about that because, A, it's incredibly scary because I haven't done anything like this before. But I think I just have to start it and then I should be okay going forward. Much like what you're doing, right? It must have been pretty scary doing that. But it's incredibly brave and you're doing some cool stuff. So I'm excited to do that. And publish it and also just roll it out and start really getting involved in that. I'm involved in a couple of cool projects or not-for-profit organizations that look at artificial intelligence, cyber, bias, ethics, providing submissions and reviews on things coming out, A, for government, but other aspects as well. So just building that out, publishing more of that in terms of blogs and views and opinions, and hopefully building out this website, which will be really, really cool. So hopefully in the next couple of months, and then I'll send you a link, maybe you can send it to your audience. But yeah, it's something I'm definitely excited about and, and something I'll hopefully start focusing on. When I start my master's, the focus you have to do this big project on, on or dissertation to an extent on, on a topic. And this, this is the topic I'm going to look at as well. So hopefully it will, it will continue developing and I'll be in a position to publish it in maybe four, four or five months. That sounds awesome. And you know what? We'll just do, we'll just have to do another, uh, <laughs> another future of work interview on the topic of you know, all the things that we didn't get to discuss today <laughs> no, definitely. and that you're going um, to discuss at length in your blog. So <laughs> no, definitely. But this has been awesome because I think we need more discussions on this and more, more people to start really talking about this. And I think, I think if anything, for all the bad things the pandemic brought, I think it's brought a whole lot of good things in terms of fast pacing the digital landscape of not just banking but industry in general right retail and and even fast moving goods etc i think the world is changing and i hope it continues changing and just doesn't die but i think this is a new revolution that we're heading heading towards definitely yeah and you know we're gonna we're gonna be leading the leading the charge here marino you're going to be well you are already claudia so i'm just following in the footsteps Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm leading, I'm, I'm leading strong here. (laughs) No, talk, talk about, talk about scary, talk about scary, you know, (laughs) it's definitely scary. Well, it was awesome having you on the show, Marina. Thanks so much again for your time and best of luck with your initiatives right now and your blog and, and your master's program, which is starting quite a way. Thank you. Surely. Thank you for having me. It's been awesome. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And to everybody watching, uh, Marino Vedanaygam can be uh, reached, uh, I believe, on LinkedIn. Are there any other places where folks can reach you? LinkedIn, really. LinkedIn. Everything's on there, yeah. Awesome. Cool. So uh, thanks again for joining us. And for the folks watching, please go ahead and subscribe and give us a like and, and we'll publish more episodes like this one and more conversations. Thanks again for joining and have a good one.